you've seen my other videos, you're probably noticing that the kitchen has changed. And the reason for that is that we've moved. And that's also the reason why I haven't posted for a while, either cooking videos or woodworking videos. The woodworking shop's not ready, but the kitchen obviously is. So this is my kickoff video at my new house, which is located in Pauling, New York. And what we're going to make are scones. Now scones have become pretty commonplace, but the ones you get mostly are large, dense, they're delicious, but there are other kinds of scones that you may not even know about. What we're going to do today are sour cream scones, which have the advantage of using no other fat other than sour cream, and are really very quick and easy to make, even though the dough itself is a little fidgety, and you'll see as my hands get encrusted with scone dough, how fidgety it can be, but it all works out really very well. And I'm using the recipe from this nice King Arthur cookbook, which has some wonderful basic recipes and good discussions on when to use baking powder and baking soda. Really very, very nice book, stands out from the rest of them. All right, we start, as we do with recipes of this type, by mixing our dries. I'm doubling the recipe because I want to make lots of them since they go very, very quickly. So we start out with flour, and I'm going to measure out three cups of all-purpose flour. Now when you're measuring by volume, not by weighing, you want to try to get things as consistent as possible because flour can pack down. It makes a big difference in your outcome. So what I like to do is to stir up my flour. Here's my one cup measure and I pack it in lightly. And then I just level it off. You don't press it down or mash it, you just level it till it's nice and even. And there's one. And I do the same thing for cups two. I'm going to add four teaspoons of baking powder. Right, not to be confused with the baking soda. Here's a shortcut. This is one teaspoon. And my tablespoon is another three teaspoons. So rather than measuring them out separately, this gives me four teaspoons of baking powder. All right, now I'm going to add a teaspoon of baking soda. And since little hard lumps of baking soda can be very unpleasant, although I'm you know, measuring it off on the self-leveling part of the container, what I always like to do is simply to mash it between my fingers. You could use a little strainer if you want, but that's a good guarantee that you're not going to get these little acrid lumps of baking soda. All right, and the last of the dry ingredients, well, next to the last one, is a teaspoon of salt. And then we add half a cup of sugar. And I level it off, although you can dip sugar because packing down is not a problem. I level it off the same way. There's half a cup of sugar which means these scones are not going to be terribly sweet, and you'll sweeten them with the jam and all the good stuff you put on it. All right, now that's the dries. Now, the best way by far to mix up your dries is with a whisk. Forget about any recipe that says to sift things together, where the aim is to mix them up. It's been established that that really doesn't work. And if you really want tangible proof of it, try adding something dark, like a little bit of cinnamon, Watch how it disperses, and you'll find that the whisk very quickly and easily gets everything mixed in. You certainly don't want little salty spots, so that's an important first step. All right, now, with traditional scones, you would add the wet ingredients you cut in the butter, you'd add the eggs, and you would add the milk or whatever other liquid you're using. Here, the only other wet ingredient
is sour cream. And since I'm doubling this recipe, I'm using two cups of sour cream or a pint. And of course, that's pre-mixed. And you just dump it in there. Now, some people don't like the taste of sour cream. But in the scones, just as when you use buttermilk instead of sweet milk, you don't taste it. It just adds a very, very nice, rich flavor. Notice, no butter, which is really quite unusual. Now, here's the tricky part. This is dense, the sour cream, and it doesn't like to mix with the flour. So you have to be a little patient and sort of coax the flour in gently until it's absorbed most of it, trying not to spill too much on the counter as you're doing it. I like this nice big spoon. Fingers are also a good tool to use for cleaning things off. The spoon is a synthetic. I don't like using wood when I do baking, if the wooden spoon's also been used to stir a garlicky sauce for obvious reasons. These are clean, odor-free, and a really, really nice thing to have. I'm going to mix it until the flour has been absorbed by the cream. You don't want to overmix because you don't want it to get tough, but on the other hand, it does have to form a dough before we move on to the next step of doing the final incorporation. All right, what I'm going to do is to knead it, which basically means I'm going to just sort of mush it into the flour to incorporate it until I have a cohesive dough. And this is not an unusual step in a lot of these kind of doughs where they'll say to mix it in the bowl then to put it out and give it a small amount of kneading, not to toughen it, but to get it all together. And I think the kneading is actually gentler than the mixing. I remember one Julia Child pie crust recipe where they do something called a frisage, I think it's called, where you push the dough with, your, with the heel of your hand to do a final blending on a pie crust dough which surprised me, but it worked. So this is a gentle kneading. I'm using a similar motion to what I'd use if I were making bread, which is a standard kneading motion. And as you can see, little by little, we're actually getting a nice cohesive dough out of this. I'm going to divide it into thirds. What I'm going to do is to make three circles, divide each of them into eight, and then put them on a baking sheet that has parchment on it, which makes it much easier than trying to grease it or any other way. All right, I think this is about ready. And since this mat is a little fragile, I don't use a metal bench knife. I use a plastic one to divide my dough. If I wanted it absolutely really even, I would scale it out weigh it so I get three balls of equal size, but I'm not that concerned about this. They're a little bigger, a little smaller. It's not like I'm selling them and somebody says, I don't want the little one, I want the big one. All right, and you also can scrape off your hands. I mean, don't think about making these if you're squeamish about getting your hands dirty, because it's just, it's not that kind of a recipe. All right, once you've scraped off about as much as you can, I think what I'm going to do is to put a little bit of flour on this, just to make it a little easier to get them off. So let me go wash my hands, clean up a little bit, get a little flour, get out my baking sheet, and we'll get these little guys ready to put. I'm going to go sprinkle a little flour in my working area so that things don't stick. Spread it out. If you keep the dough on top, it doesn't get incorporated and doesn't make it tough. It just sort of lets you move it around. Okay, so what I'm doing now, and I can flour my hands a little bit so it doesn't stick to my hands, is rather than rolling, which is really not necessary, I'm patting them into a circle about half an inch thick. If you want to make big ones, you could divide it in half. If you want to make giant scones, you could just divide it, just not divide it at all, just make one big circle. But I like them small. That way you can have more than one. Okay, now I'm going to use my bench knife to 
to divide this into eighths. Remember I said this was going to be a fidgety dough and it's proving me right, but it does work. Notice that they are coming out. Let's shape it a little bit. And we'll put them on the parchment sheet. If you've not gotten used to working with bake, baking parchment, it's probably one of the most important transitions you can make from you know, regular home baking to what the professionals use. It just works out much, much better. And anything that saves cleanup time is always a plus. I'm going to see if I can space them because I want to get them all on one baking sheet. Sometimes they bake scones, they score them and then break them apart. So if they come into each other, it's not a big deal. All right, and I'm going to do the exact same thing with the remaining two bowls of dough. I'm going to pat them out and divide them into eighths. And get them on my baking sheet. And by then, the oven should be close to being preheated if it's not fully there. All of the scones have been cut up. I have three circles worth, so that's three times eight. That's 24 scones. My oven is beeped, indicating that it's reached cruising temperature. Oops, we don't want this to come. All right. Let me suggest that once you get the parchment on, you hold the pan level, because everything can slide off. I'm going to put it in, and let me just check the baking time. All right, 15 minutes baking time. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set it to 10 and take a look at it because you can always give it a little more once you've overbaked them. There's not much you can do about it. So let's put it in. I'll set my timer for 10 minutes, and I'll check it and see where it is at that point. The buzzer went off at the 10-minute mark, and it looked like it did indeed need a few more minutes. So I gave it a few more minutes, about 15 minutes. And when I put the light on in the oven, it looked about ready. So let's take them out and see how we did. they looked when they went in and how lovely they look when they come out you can see that it really is very forgiving and the final step of course is to get them off here onto the cooling rack the bottoms should be nicely browned you feel them they sort of feel done on the outside they don't sink they don't feel wet but they're not overly brown because you don't want burnt scones and we'll get them all on here. If you don't have a baking rack, again along with baking parchment, that's really something you need. You can get a small one. I have various sizes and it's just the easiest way to cool things quickly and without letting the bottoms get all soggy. Alright, so let's get this out of the way before I burn myself on it. And there we have 24 beautiful, light, flaky scones. I hope you enjoyed watching the video and do give this one a try. I guarantee you people will absolutely love it and be knocking down your door for the recipe. Thanks for watching the video. Stay tuned for more now that I'm back in action.